Well, of course, um, several, two decades have passed uh, since then. Um, I don't know whether I would talk about how different I am, but what I've learned uh, since then, and of course I've learned a great deal over the last uh, 20 years. It doesn't mean that I uh, do not um, still consider myself a socialist, a communist, if you will. I'm still very much a critic of capitalism. Um, however, I'm no longer a member of the Communist Party. Um, um, although I'm still very politically active in a number of organizations and have done work with uh, members of the Communist Party. Well, I lived in an area of Birmingham, Alabama, uh, known as Dynamite Hill because so many of the homes uh, purchased by black families would be bombed. Um, it seems to me that uh, I've brought a great deal from that earliest period of my life into my adult life. Uh, uh, and. I suppose I might say that I appreciate the fact that uh, during those turbulent times, uh, growing up in what was considered to be the most segregated city of the South, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, oftentimes referred to as the Johannesburg of the South, uh, my mother always uh, reminded us that things did not have to be that way, that things could, in fact, be different, and that we could work to change that world. My mother um, grew up in a rural area of Alabama, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, near a city called Sil a town rather, called Sylacauga. Um, there was no high school uh, for black students in the uh, area, and so she had to move to Birmingham uh, when she was a teenager in order to go to high school. Um, she then went on to uh, college and got involved with organizations like the NAACP. She got involved with the uh, Southern Negro Youth um, Congress. She was active in the effort to um, ascertain the freedom of um, the freedom for uh, the Scottsboro Nine, who were nine young black boys um, fraudulently um, charged with and eventually convicted of rape. Uh, this is one of the major cases of that era. It had international uh, publicity. And so I, um, I suppose um, my own political activism um, is in many ways a legacy of, of my mother's. She's still alive, yeah. She, um, she has Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. uh, and she lives in Cleveland, Ohio, um, near my brother. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. She was um, um, quite active in the campaign for my freedom. She traveled across the country. Uh, she even made some international uh, trips. Uh, and as a matter of fact, my entire family was, was active. Uh, my brother, who at that time was a uh, professional football player, he played for the Cleveland Browns. He was uh, you know, quite active. My sister uh, traveled throughout the world. Um, my sister at that time had just had a um, baby. And uh, my mother took care of uh, Issa uh, when she was uh, one year old, two years old, and oftentimes my mother um, had Issa accompany her on her um, domestic trips uh, when my sister was abroad. So yeah, she, she was quite active. My entire family was in the courtroom on that day on June 4th, uh, 1972, when I was acquitted. Well, I guess I'm um, plagued with uh, the assumption that uh, my hair was more important than my um, contributions, uh, political, intellectual contributions. Uh, and however, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't disturb me uh, uh, 
because I'm aware of the ways in which uh, history, historical memory is um, constructed. And one of the things I've noted uh, very recently is uh, a proliferation of T-shirts, uh, uh, sort of further commodification of uh, that image. Well, you know, first of all, um, I had no intention to make a name for myself. Uh, I um, was a graduate student in uh, the University of California, San Diego, and had been asked to apply for a job in the philosophy department at UCLA uh, because they needed someone who could teach uh, continental philosophy and specifically someone who would be able to teach Marxism, um, you know, Marxist uh, philosophy. Um, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, and in the U.S. as well. It uh, never occurred to me that because I had also recently joined the Communist Party that this would be an issue in my hiring. I had no idea, as a matter of fact, uh, um, I said later that had I known that uh, you know all of this would be a consequence of my attempting to uh, do a job uh, there in the philosophy department at the University of California, uh, Los Angeles, I probably would not have accepted the position. I had no idea. It was uh, uh, it, it was a complete shock to me that. Uh, I would be called to answer for my membership in the Communist Party. Uh, you know, one of the points I, I made uh, to the chancellor who wrote me a letter asking whether I was indeed a member of the Communist Party was that uh, it was not a general rule that um, uh, professors employed by the university were asked to identify their political affiliations. I had never heard of anyone being asked whether they were a member of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or any other party. Uh, so yeah, this was, this was quite a shock. Uh, but it did unleash uh, an enormous amount of publicity and did eventually, in, in, in a certain way, lead to uh, my um, uh, encounter with the state of California and the months I spent in jail. Ronald Reagan was a part of that story, yes. He was a part of that story in the sense that he was uh, the governor of California at that time. He was a member of the Board of Regents, an ex officio member of the Board of Regents. And uh, it was the decision of the Regents uh, to uh, um, basically fire me uh, based on a um, um, a rule on a, in a statue in the books of the University of California that emanated from the McCarthy era uh, that indicated that no employee of the university could be a member of the Communist Party. Well, I was fired a couple of times. <laughs> I was fired before I delivered my first lecture. Uh, however, I was able to get uh, an injunction from the um, Supreme Court, uh, uh, from the courts, I can't remember which level it was, that allowed me to continue to teach. At the end of that year, uh, this would be the, um, the spring of 1970, I was uh, fired once again, not for being a member of the Communist Party, but rather for conduct uh, uh, unfitting the position of professor or something like that. They refer to my political uh, speeches and political organizing. Um, that was um, in the, that was June 1970 and I was arrested in October 1970. George Jackson was a um, political prisoner, uh, political prisoner uh, because he while he had been arrested as, um, as an 18-year-old for on charges of um, robbery stemming from um, a failed attempt, I think, on the part of acquaintances of his to uh, take um, $70 from a gas station, uh, he was sentenced to uh, 
an indeterminate sentence, one year to life. And while he was in prison, he became an activist. Uh, he uh, did a great deal of organizing around issues of uh, racism within the prison system. He made connections with organizations uh, on the outside and attempted to persuade um, um, many of the prisoners that they should reflect upon their own actions. He, he talked about wanting to transform a criminal mentality into a revolution, revolutionary mentality. But I can say that from the vantage point of um, the 21st century, we uh, can identify important contributions he made to the effort to develop a radical critique of the prison system, and I'll probably talk about that later. But in any event, uh, George Jackson was um, charged with uh, uh, the murder of a prison guard, along with two other uh, black prisoners at Soledad Prison, uh, John Cluchet and Fleda Drumgo. Um, and this was in connection with um, an effort to um, protest the killing of prisoners. Uh, and I mean, the, the, the story is somewhat complicated. Maybe I should say that it happened as a result of the um, s policies of segregation within the uh, California prison system, which still prevail. Black prisoners are kept separate from white prisoners or kept separate from Latino prisoners. So, in any event, uh, I found out about this uh, case, these three young black men who were charged with murder and did some investigation and uh, discovered that there, was a, there seemed to be a similarity between his predicament, the predicament of George Jackson, and my own predicament. And I can remember then, uh, I began to talk about the political repression uh, within the um, university system and the political repression within the prison system. And I said, to put it uh, simply, that I was about to lose my job because of my political beliefs, and here were three um, men who were about to lose their lives because of their political commitment. So that is the connection that initially developed. Oh, no, no, I had not known him. Um, I um, read about his case in the newspaper and became active in a defense committee that took shape in Los Angeles. And in the meantime, I uh, r realized that he had actually written to me. Uh, he had written to me um, not, as, um, not because he knew me, but because he had read all of the newspaper articles about my predicament at UCLA. So among the thousands and thousands and thousands of letters that I received, there was a letter uh, by uh, George Jackson. But I did meet his uh, family early on. Uh, and they were quite involved in the defense campaign. And I did eventually meet him um, at a um, trial. Well, on, well, perhaps I should back up and, and say that um, among those many thousands of letters that I received, uh, um, quite a substantial number were threats and death threats. Uh, uh, after I um, took the position at UCLA, uh, the regents attempted to fire me. I uh, was the target of, um, of many, many threats. As a matter of fact, during my trial, I think we had three huge binders of letters uh, uh, and um, recorded messages uh, from people who had uh, um, threatened me in some way or another. All of which is to say I had security, um, both the campus uh, police and the campus police were committed to uh, doing security for me while I was on campus, uh, but not once I left the campus. So, you know, one of the things I've always said was they wanted to guarantee that I didn't get killed on the campus, right? And so I had to have security um, off campus, including in my apartment. I purchased. Uh, 
uh, some guns that were used by a number of people who acted as uh, security for me. On August 7th, uh, Jonathan Jackson, George Jackson's younger brother, who had uh, participated in that um, security detail, one might say, uh, used uh, weapons that were registered in my name and uh, entered a courtroom in San Rafael, uh, California, the city closest to uh, San Quentin, and attempted to, um, well, we're not sure exactly what he uh, attempt, what he was attempting to do, uh, but the outcome of that encounter was that um, a judge was killed, uh, jurors were wounded, and uh, pr prisoners were killed. I was charged then because of the fact that my weapons were found on the scene with murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. It took um, 18 months. Let's see, I was a... Well, the whole, the, the, the whole um, affair took almost two years. Uh, there was August 7th. I was arrested October 13th. My trial took place in the uh, spring of 1972, and I was acquitted in um, June, on June 4th, 1972. Well, I was underground for a couple of months and had no contact. Um, I was not able to contact any. I spoke to virtually no one during that period, so I was not aware of what was going on. This is when I was on the most uh, wanted list. I, um, however, during the period when I was underground and I contemplated leaving the country, uh, because this is what had happened in a number of cases, uh, and I contemplated leaving the country because I did not feel that I could get a fair trial. Uh, and I recall that uh, in, there was a survey done um, in, among black people in Los Angeles, in uh, a defined black community, and the overwhelming majority of them indicated that they uh, understood why uh, I had chosen not to turn myself in. But I was hoping that a movement was underway. I was hoping that I would not uh, have, have to leave the country. I did not want to be in permanent exile. I did want to be in a position of, of uh, defending myself. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, I, um, I didn't know that I would be arrested. I assume that I would turn myself in. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to do that, but once I was arrested, it became very clear that people had been organizing. One of the things that I saw afterwards, uh, and it's interesting, many people now assume that I was involved in this organizing, and they said, don't you remember when we did this? Don't you remember? I said, no, I was either underground or I was in jail. Uh, but uh, there was a campaign developed to um, um, have people put stickers uh, or posters on uh, the doors of their homes indicating that I was welcome there. and. Uh, you know, for example, in the Asian American community in Washington, there was a massive campaign to uh, do this. I found out, uh, of course, that uh, many black churches had uh, gotten involved in this campaign. So it was, it was quite, um, it was a relief. It was uh, what sustained me. It was uh, what persuaded me that there would be an end to that story. Yes. Yeah, I was in jail in New York for um, six weeks, I think, something like that. And then I was eventually extradited to California. Um, 16 months. Well, I think my experiences uh, during that time were uh, quite formative, uh, formative in many ways. Um, I had been doing work around uh, prison issues. I 
as I indicated before, I was involved in the campaign to free um, George Jackson and the Soledad brothers, but also Nelson Mandela and Lolita Lebron. And uh, that had become a, um, a real theme of my life. And I kind of connect it now to my mother's involvement in similar cases in the 1930s. Uh, so I wasn't unfamiliar with the issue. However, I had not uh, been able to think through the question of the role the institution of the prison played in uh, perpetuating structures of racism and, and class bias and, 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 and so forth. And I really had not thought about the, the um, issues surrounding women in prison. And so, of course, uh, that time that I spent in jail. <laughs> OK, that was a long time ago. I've taught at various institutions. Um, uh, the, the longest, I taught for the longest period of time at San Francisco State University and the University of California, Santa Cruz, where I am now. I've taught in uh, women's studies uh, programs, uh, ethnic studies programs, philosophy departments, and currently I teach at um, the University of Calif California, Santa Cruz in the uh, interdisciplinary doctoral program, which is called History of Consciousness. I currently am also the chair of the Women's Studies Department at uh, UCSC. Well, I, I love the university environment. Uh, it's been very important for me to maintain contact with younger generations over the years. And of course, one of the problems is that the students get younger and younger and younger, and you get older and older and older. Uh, but that has, uh, for me, been a source of uh, inspiration. And Santa Cruz has an interesting history, UCSC. Uh, and I, um, I have um, a long history with this particular campus, even though it's only been 13 years that I've been teaching uh, full time. As a matter of fact, the first time I visited that campus, which is one of the newest campus with campuses within the UC system, was in connection with the campaign to free the Soledad brothers. There was a large rally there in 19... Um, 70, I think it was the spring of 1970. 1971. Well, this book was produced from the particular um, circumstances uh, uh, of that time. That is to say, an increasing number of political prisoners. I myself was in jail. And I co-edited uh, this book and contributed it to it. Of course, I co-edited it with uh, Bettina Aptaker, uh, who was uh, one of the major figures in the organizing of the campaign for my freedom. And incidentally, she, um, interestingly enough, uh, also now teaches at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in the Women's Studies Department. Well, of course, many things have changed since then, and uh, modes of expression have changed. But what I would uh, uh, indicate in response to that passage is that um, the particular uh, representation of democracy that comes from uh, uh, the government and representatives of the government is something that uh, we need to um, challenge and develop ways of uh, criticizing. Uh, I suppose I would say now is that not only um, black people in the U.S., uh, not only people of color in the U.S., uh, uh, not only working class people in this country, but people all over the world, uh, particularly in countries uh, of uh, the southern region, and particularly now in the Middle East, uh, are challenging the particular uh, kind of democracy that is that the U.S. government is uh, supposedly bringing to the rest of the world. Uh, I 
I think it's time for us to think about new versions of uh, democracy. Uh, and of course, uh, this is true for people in this country, black people included, as well as um, people all over the world. The, you know, certainly the two million people who are in prison today uh, uh, will require a different uh, uh, kind of democracy if there is to be any end to this imprisonment binge. Mm -hmm. So when did I write that? It's interesting because most recently I've been involved with a number of organizations that are precisely attempting to make those connections between intimate violence, domestic violence on the one hand, and state violence uh, on, on the other. Uh, an organization with which I'm involved in this country is um, called Insight uh, um, uh, Against Violence Against Women of Color. Then there is an organization in Australia uh, called Sisters Inside, which focuses very specifically on um, issues concerning women in prison. And one of their major campaigns over the last several years has been against the strip search which is uh, defined as state sexual assault. So when I ask you, when I wrote that, I, mm -hmm. I don't remember writing uh, that particular f formulation, but you know, certainly it's one of the major issues uh, I um, think we should address today. Well, one of the things um, we've learned is that there are many feminisms. There's not only one feminist movement, and that, as a matter of fact, many um, women of color were involved from the very beginning in the formulation of feminist ideas and ideals. Uh, uh, however, it is important to uh, point out that, uh, that the critiques of what you might call dominant feminist uh, movements um, still have some currency. Uh, uh, when, when one defines one's feminism as uh, uh, being that of providing access to, uh, women's access to, um, say, um, the corp corporate uh, suites, uh, what difference does that make to vast numbers of women who are impoverished, who are in prison? And so uh, my sense is that uh, it's important to define the kind of uh, feminism with which one uh, associates oneself. And I certainly associate myself with feminism. <laughs> Well, thank you for, you know, raising those very serious um, questions. I suppose I would first um, say that there is um, a major problem with our educational system. Education really is under siege. And uh, many people have noted that increasingly states spend far more on prisons and they spend on schools, far more on the resources uh, that are used uh, by uh, the increasingly expanding prison system than they do on the resources that are used by students and teachers. Uh, uh, in the state where I'm from, California, beginning teachers earn far less than beginning uh, prison guards. Uh, so it seems to me that in order to um, create the kinds of conditions that will lead to um, a different um, valuation of education. Uh, and I totally understand what you mean. Uh, I grew up believing that education was um, intrinsically connected with the struggle for freedom, that one could not imagine freedom if uh, one uh, did not have access to education. Uh, and now, of course, uh, education is considered more a commodity than anything else. Uh, I, I've been um, thinking about this question of how to transform the way 
young people think about education so that it doesn't compete with, say, sports or music. Uh, and this isn't to say that music isn't important. This isn't to say that sports uh, are not important. They are extremely important. Uh, but when education is viewed as simply a way to uh, guarantee that one earns more money, then there are a lot of competing uh, paths one can take to earn more money. So my sense is that we have to begin to uh, re-evaluate uh, the entire system. Kids aren't going to change just because we ask them to change. They're only, they will only change if all of the conditions are such that uh, they have an opportunity to, to um, realize how wonderful knowledge is. They have to learn how to love the process of acquiring knowledge. They have to learn how to, you know, love books. Uh, and this is, um, this is a major challenge, but I thank you very much for raising that issue. Well, I came to um, write this book. Um, in connection with uh, the project of my previous book where I had attempted to think about uh, black women's contributions to feminist um, ideas, feminist theory, feminist uh, writings, uh, feminist discourse. Uh, and I recognize that um, if I did not consider another mode of expression, I would only be uh, able to identify uh, ideas produced by middle class black women, by black women who had access uh, to education. So, you know, what about uh, black women who did not have those opportunities, uh, who uh, used uh, their voices or their instruments instead of uh, the pen. And I thought that it might be uh, possible by looking at uh, the, the evolution of the, of, of, of the blues during a certain period to think about ways in which uh, black communities engaged in conversations about gender, about sexuality. Um, and first of all, it was a, it was a real pleasure to write, uh, uh, and I, I absolutely love the music, and it seems to me that this, um, this body of music, particularly the music produced by women, uh, you know, most people aren't aware of the fact that uh, the, when the blues began to be recorded, it was black women who were uh, uh, the, f the, the pioneers in, 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 in this area. Uh, and, you know, not only uh, Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith, but, uh, you know, women like uh, Ida Cox and Rosa Henderson, and, uh, I mean, we can go on and on. So, uh, I wrote this book because I thought that it would be important for us to value the sphere of culture differently, the sphere of popular culture, and for us to take into consideration the extent to which um, politics happens there as well. And uh, today, uh, certainly with the globalization of black music, uh, um, uh, black artists are responsible for uh, in encouraging people all over the world to think about uh, a range of issues. Some of those issues uh, may not precisely be the issues I would suggest, but uh, the, the, the sphere of uh, music as music culture as uh, connected to politics is something that I wanted to uh, emphasize. It's a more of a historical book, but uh, it gestures uh, towards possibilities of uh, thinking about hip hop as well. So you are a um, prison officer? Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Well, you know, that's a huge question you ask. Uh, and it is important, I believe, that people who uh, work 
in positions like yours uh, um, think about the long-term consequences of uh, of this work uh, now I should I should tell you that I consider myself an abolitionist um, and for the last 20 30 years or so I've been affiliated with um, with groups of people who want to encourage others to think about the possibility of abolishing prisons as the dominant mode of punishment. Uh, now, uh, because I'm an abolitionist, I also think about reform differently. I think about reform not so much in relation to those um, uh, processes that will create a better prison system, but rather those processes which will better respond to the needs of the people who are in, in prison. So I would uh, suggest that you think about the, the tension between um, um, what we might call decarceration. How is it that we can guarantee that the numbers of, of people in prison uh, do not continue to rise. As a matter of fact, how can we begin to reduce those numbers? And at the same time, how can we guarantee that people who are in prison have access to the kinds of programs they need? And in connection with some of, with the earlier conversation I was having with um, the caller about education, I would argue that education is absolutely essential, both inside and outside. Well, absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the government should fund programs that, um, well, should pro uh, fund alcohol and drug programs uh, that people have access to before they get sent to prison. I mean, this is one of the, the major problems. Uh, uh, many people first have an encounter with such a program when they go to prison. Why can't they do that before? they uh, place themselves uh, uh, at that, uh, in that kind of risk. Okay, Herbert Marcuse was a, um, a um, philosopher uh, born in Germany who left Germany during uh, the 1930s uh, because of the emergent Nazi uh, regime. Eventually came to this country and I first encountered him in the early 1960s at Brandeis University where I was an undergraduate. Uh, I was very much uh, taken by his approach to philosophy and to history and to politics and studied very closely with him as an undergraduate. Uh, eventually I um, traveled to Germany to study with some colleagues of his in Frankfurt and then return to study with him at the University of California, uh, San Diego. Um, uh, he was around the period of the late 60s, uh, one of the most important figures in the student movement. Of course, at that time, he wasn't, he wasn't a student. He was, uh, I believe, in his 60s. Uh, 60s, 70s, um, he helped young people to theorize uh, the uh, uh, insurgencies that were happening in, uh, on the campus, uh, among workers, among communities of color. And because he um, was a critical theorist and saw himself as producing knowledge that would hopefully make a difference in the social world. He uh, felt that interventions, direct political interventions, could sometimes uh, um, help. Now, he was threatened a great deal as a result of this. I should say that San Diego was and is a, quite a conservative uh, place. And he received, uh, you know, quite a number of um, death threats uh, himself at that time. Uh, there are people who still uh, uh, 
are very much influenced by the work of Herbert Marcuse. Uh, I, I can name some of his books, uh, uh, Eros and Civilization, One Dimensional Man, um, um, Three um, Lectures on Liberation, Counter Revolution and Revolt, and so forth and so on. Uh, people still read these texts. As a matter of fact, I often assign them in the course I teach on critical theory in the Marxist tradition at UCSC. Um, uh, one of my uh, PhD students is writing a dissertation on Herbert Marcuse. Uh, his work is being Re released again, uh, particularly since uh, the archives have been available. And I should say one final thing about him. Um, last summer, his ashes were interred in uh, Berlin, um, in the same cemetery uh, where Hegel is buried, where Brecht is buried. And I had the opportunity to participate uh, with his family in this um, solemn ceremony, uh, bringing his ashes uh, you know, back to Germany. Well, I never smuggled a gun into a prison. I didn't smuggle a gun anywhere. Um, and um, I'm sorry that you're under the wrong impression. Well, um, the caller from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, um, a place uh, I know well. I uh, was born in Birmingham, which is not that far from Tuscaloosa. So I appreciate um, your words and uh, must respond by saying that all of us have a role. Uh, and that uh, as educators, it's important for us to be involved with the historically black colleges and universities as well as uh, with the predominantly white colleges and universities. I think we need to be everywhere. Um, but I agree with your sentiment uh, that there is work to be done. Well, I, I was um, raised a um, congregationalist. My, mother was a Congregationalist, uh, is a Congregationalist. My father was an Episcopalian. So I grew up uh, in um, the church in that way. Um, I still have uh, ties particularly to uh, religious communities that are involved in um, social activism. Um, I don't um, regularly attend church, uh, but I uh, uh, have been involved quite closely with uh, a, a number of uh, religious um, communities and circles and appreciate the importance of spirituality, however it is expressed in whatever religion. And I should say that uh, uh, with the current situation in Iraq and the Middle East, it's it's important for us to think about the ways in which uh, religion uh, serves as a major pretext for um, racism and um, you know considering the passage of the Patriot Act and the the horrendous racial profiling that has happened uh, in this country with in connection with um, uh, the Muslim religion I absolutely um, agree with you. I would say, yes, there is a major link. Um, in the work in which I've been involved recent, recently, um, and as I indicated uh, before, the sort of schools, not jails, education, not incarceration, these uh, campaigns point out that oftentimes more resources in um, poor communities, uh, particularly poor communities of color, are relegated to uh, security. Um, now, uh, when more money is spent on guaranteeing that there are uh, security guards or uh, metal detectors or uh, ways to provide, uh, you know, what is uh, often uh, described as safety in the schools, then there are resources designed to encourage people to develop a love of learning. We have serious problems. Uh, and 
so yes, I think we have to begin to reverse this situation. Well, uh, I met Toni uh, Morrison when she was an editor at uh, Random House, uh, and she edited uh, my autobiography, and I am forever uh, grateful to her uh, for encouraging me to write it, for um, helping me in, 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 in many respects. And I, um, I have all of the admiration in the world for her. I love her books, and she's a wonderful person. I just really love Tony. Well, I, I don't know whether uh, that would have been a question that would have en entered my mind. Uh, uh, she had already um, written um, uh, a couple of novels, which uh, I read and found, you know, absolutely marvelous. Uh, so it didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me that she became so famous. Uh, but what I like about her is the fact that that doesn't really matter. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Maxine Waters uh, has been um, um, a consistent voice, uh, particularly around issues of justice and equality, not only for black people, uh, but for uh, all people who uh, are uh, subjugated in some way or another, and she she always has this has a has an international perspective, a global perspective. She had that then when I first met her, which was uh, in the 70s, uh, I believe, or yeah, some sometime uh, around that period, and most recently, of course. Uh, uh, she's encouraged us to uh, think a little bit more deeply about what's what happened in Haiti. And now, of course, Haiti is no longer in the news. We only hear about Haiti in connection with the uh, hurricane. Uh, and that disturbs me. Yeah, that greatly disturbs me. Oh, well, you know, everyone makes mistakes. <laughs> and I'm sure he did. And I'm sure he would admit that he did. Uh, but Jesse Jackson has been an important voice uh, uh, over the years as well. Uh, his presidential candidacy helped to um, consolidate uh, uh, some important constituencies. And you know, while, of course, there was never any um, a hope that he could actually win, uh, people began to think of themselves as uh, having a measure of power within the electoral com uh, community, particularly if they came together uh, under the kinds of coalitions. The Rainbow Coalition, of course, is the term that Jesse Jackson uh, used. Uh, and I think that, that that influence has been lasting. Well, I. Um, I do think that Huey Newton is an important historical figure. As you know, uh, he, along with Bobby Seale, founded the Black Panther Party precisely at a moment when there needed to be some change. Uh, there was a civil rights movement, and some of us uh, were, who were affiliated with the civil rights movement were not entirely satisfied with its range and scope. And so Huey Newton um, took up um, the question of liberation in a more radical context. And this was the right moment at the right time, because within a very short period of time, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, not only in this country, but all over the world, began to you know, rally. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a Black Panther Party in in Israel, a Black Panther Party in um, Brazil, and I can go on and on. Now, Huey had a lot of problems. Uh, he made mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Uh, but he also had demons, as Erica Huggins uh, put it at the uh, memorial at his funeral. I, uh, and those demons had to do with drugs. They had to do with uh, abuse. Uh, 
Uh, and in many ways, he was a kind of figure um, who captured s so many of the problems uh, in uh, our communities, regardless of what uh, racial background we're talking about. Uh, and at that funeral, Erica Hagen said, uh, regardless of all of the demons that he failed to uh, withstand, he still has a historical importance. We cannot, we cannot uh, uh, eradicate the fact that at a particular historical moment, he did uh, what was needed, and he was able to rally people together in a way that has lasting significance. So th those would be my words about Huey Newton. Well, I was involved in the Black Panther Party. I'm not sure whether I was actually a member. I thought I was a member, and then I was told that I could only be a member of the Black Panther Party if I uh, was no longer a member of the Communist Party because uh, uh, there was some regulation that... Well, anyway, uh, so I, I was active in the Black Panther Party for quite a number of years, uh, and, uh, you know, certainly uh, even... Uh, when I went to jail, I had um, sympathies and, and was in touch with many of the members and leaders. Well, it seems to me that um, we've lost the ability to distinguish between democracy and capitalism. It is, I think, an effort to sell capitalism to the Middle East that's uh, going on. Uh, our president uh, uh, rarely makes the distinction. And I think that uh, it is up to other voices to uh, begin a conversation about a democracy that will raise all of the issues that are silenced in uh, uh, during this period, um, yeah, this is this is what I would say. I could refer to some of those issues. I could talk about economic democracy. I could talk about uh, uh, educational democracy. I could talk about democracy in relation to the horrendous situation we encounter uh, in our uh, prison system and the very fact that we have more people in prison than in any other um, country in the world is an indication that there's something uh, terribly wrong with the particular kind of democracy that uh, exists in this country. Okay, well, first of all, um, Jonathan Jackson did not um, um, kill the judge in the way that was represented, uh, and I can say this because uh, I spent many, many months in a courtroom in which we examined all of the evidence, uh, and both uh, the prosecution, well, of course the defense uh, proposed this, uh, but the prosecution agreed that um, the first shots were fired by San Quentin guards. And that, as a matter of fact, the killing of the judge uh, was, uh, uh, and I, I know I'm going through all of these details, but I think they may matter at this uh, moment, that the, the killing of the judge happened as a, as a reflex after Jonathan Jackson was already killed. Uh, and as a matter of fact, during my trial, we, uh, we cross-examined some of the San Quentin guards who testified and I'll never forget, one of my attorneys said, well, is it true that San Quentin prison authorities have instructed you to prevent an escape attempt at any cost? And the answer was yes. Uh, is it true that if it requires the life of uh, uh, one person or a hundred persons, you must prevent that escape attempt. And he went on, and the, the, the guard answered yes each time. Uh, and 
So I do not apologize for uh, the fact that Jonathan Jackson killed a judge. I'm trying to understand those uh, circumstances. Uh, well, I always felt that that question itself was wrongly formulated. Um, uh, is violence justified in revolutionary struggles mm -hmm. and struggles for equality and um, justice? Uh, uh, because it seems to me that you put the cart before the horse. Uh, uh, in South Africa, for example, if one looks at the history of the effort to end apartheid, uh, you will see that there are uh, moments in which uh, the, uh, there's an absolute refusal to engage in uh, violent uh, resistance. But then on the other hand, you have a government that is wedded to violence. Uh, and eventually, people in South Africa who were struggling for justice and equality came to the conclusion that um, they had to take up arms. Uh, and the African National Congress did take up arms. Uh, and of course, eventually, apartheid was uh, overturned. And that armed struggle now has the, uh, one would say, the statue of the American Revolution where people also took up arms because it was not possible to guarantee uh, American independence without doing that. Uh, so that's the context in which mm -hmm. I would uh, like to think about this issue. Well, uh, thank you for your comments. And um, we could continue this conversation forever, of course. Uh, but I will respond to one aspect of your comment or your question, and that is, uh, that um, racism never uh, remains uh, the same uh, at all um, historical moments. Uh, the kind of racisms that we are encountering today are quite different from uh, the racisms with uh, which we feel most comfortable. Um, and it seems to me that um, you know, first of all, racism, of course, is not just a black-white issue. And that, that should be obvious, and it should be especially obvious in light of the e emergence of the so-called war on uh, terror. Uh, the figure of the terrorist is a racialized figure. Uh, the the, the, the so-called war on terror has a great deal to uh, do with um, a uh, with racist assumptions about who ought to govern the world. But that will lead us in other directions. So I, I, I do want to um, suggest that we also think about racist structures today. Uh, racist attitudes may not be as uh, nearly as apparent as they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But uh, there are institutional structures that uh, into which uh, racism is inscribed. We've been talking about education, the educational structures. Uh, we should talk about uh, who gets the jobs and who doesn't, uh, unemployment figures. We should talk about uh, who gets to go to what uh, uh, colleges and universities and who gets to go to prison. You know, why is it that there are um, far more black men to uh, focus particularly on men in prison than there are uh, in colleges and universities. Uh, uh, you know, what is, uh, uh, what is the um, relation between the new modes of racism and immigration policy, uh, particularly as they affect uh, people from Mexico and Central America? Um, Asian uh, 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 immigrants are now coming under attacks. So this, is, this question of, of race and racism, it's really complicated. Uh, it's not going to be solved uh, by uh, declaring that, human, that civil rights and, and human rights have won. Uh, it continues. Uh, and I um, think it's our responsibility to um, continue to um, make this apparent. OK, you've asked a lot of questions <laughs> uh, and made a lot of observations. Uh, 
in response to the in response to the first set of of comments i i suppose i would say that at this particular moment it's important especially for black people and for all people in this country to think of ourselves as part of a uh, part of the world as part of global communities uh, and not to think so narrowly that uh, we fall prey to um, the notion of American exceptional exceptionalism uh, and oppressed communities in this country uh, um, are also affected by prevailing ideologies and I think it's important for us uh, to be, be aware of the tendency to think of our own particular predicaments as exceptional in the world as well. Um, in response to the second um, question about reparations, I do think that the conversation around reparations is important. Uh, and it's an important global conversation as well. Because black people in the US are not the only community uh, affected by uh, slavery and colonialism, uh, imperialism. And so I would suggest that we think about some structural uh, modes of reparation. It seems to me that, um, that reparation ought to involve a revamping of the entire educational system. Uh, and of course, not only the descendants of slaves would benefit uh, from this, but uh, uh, Latinos and Asian Americans and poor white people, and of course, the indigenous inhabitants of this country would benefit from this uh, reparation as well. One other major point on the reparations agenda, which we don't usually hear about and which we don't usually talk about, ought to be the abolition of the death penalty. Because I think that, that the persistence of the death penalty today is uh, an inheritance of slavery, a direct inheritance of slavery. And uh, the abolition of the death penalty would be uh, an important uh, uh, step toward beginning to eradicate slavery's stranglehold on the present and the future. Well, thank you uh, for the comments. Um, of course, uh, we've come a long way since 1968, which is uh, the uh, Olympics you referred to that took place in 1968 in Mexico City. Um, we've come a long way, but problems persist. Uh, we've come a long way, but we still have even further to go. And, you know, as someone who's been around uh, quite a long time, uh, the previous caller who said he was 68 uh, indicated that he was 20 years older than I am. Uh, and I, I should say that he's only eight years <laughs> older than I am. <laughs> But having been around uh, for a number of years, it has uh, become clear to me that um, whenever we achieve uh, a victory, whenever we make uh, changes that uh, we think will bring about change, uh, uh, we can't assume that these changes will persist forever in the same way and the same form. Um, civil rights, the movement for civil rights was extremely important uh, in its day, uh, but conditions have changed, conditions have transformed, and now civil rights gets deployed uh, in other contexts. Uh, uh, Ward Connolly in the state of California uh, developed an anti-affirmative action initiative under the sign of civil rights. Uh, um, so it seems to me that uh, what happens when we do uh, effectively uh, make change is that we reconfigure the terrain on which we work. Uh, these victories allow us to think about new issues and new problems. and. Uh, the, initially, 
the movement for black liberation was a movement for black men's liberation, right? A very narrow uh, conception of what might count as black liberation. Uh, you know, now, of course, uh, we, uh, we recognize how gendered that conception was, and we recognize that we have to be attentive not only to issues of gender, but um, sexuality, um, nation. And so I would say that it's actually quite exciting to witness how each generation takes up these ideas and transforms them and adds more to them. Uh, and to me, that is what, um, you know, not that there's inevitable progress. Uh, there isn't. Uh, it, it, it is dependent on uh, who decides to do what at what time. Uh, but it is exciting to uh, think that we can you know, actually bring about some change. Well, of course, uh, Tupac has become a legend. Uh, and uh, it's very tragic that his life was uh, cut so short. Um, I think that Tupac um, Shakur brought a lot to the table, uh, raised issues, uh, uh, particularly within hip-hop culture, uh, that uh, helped to broaden people's consciousness. Now, there are some things that I would take issue with, uh, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, the extent to which he seemed um, dedicated to uh, taking up a legacy, changing it, transforming it, uh, uh, and encouraging people to think about uh, liberation, freedom, um, equality. And that, I think, was uh, an important contribution. Mm. Well, of course, um, that is um, a lofty goal. Uh, we would all like to be judged by the content of our character. Um, during these days, however, Martin Luther King's words have been um, um, given a different resonance, particularly by those who are opposed to affirmative action. Uh, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to say a few words about uh, the way in which um, uh, the kinds of struggles Martin Luther King led around civil rights uh, issues have been um, today transformed into uh, assumptions that um, if one takes race into consideration, one must be racist. So therefore, if one takes the color of a person's skin, and race is far more than the color of one's skin, of course, into consideration in order to guarantee that one does not, for example, have an all-white uh, class of entering students, then one is thereby racist. Uh, uh, and I find that uh, extremely problematic. Uh, affirmative action, it seems to me, was just one very, very small step in um, the direction of beginning to compensate for historical uh, oppression and, and, and discrimination. And I thought we would build on affirmative action and then go somewhere else, but we've gotten stuck here. Uh, um, and um, it seems to me that it's, it's, it, affirmative action is not so much about uh, uh, using race instead of qualifications or instead of character. It's precisely about guaranteeing that a person's qualifications uh, and their character will be taken into consideration, if that makes any sense to you. Well. I must say, I find it um, somewhat difficult to write while I'm teaching and lecturing. And so I try to uh, create periods of time when I can basically uh, retreat uh, away from the telephone, um, away from the demands of students, 
And there is a place where I enjoy writing, and that place is in Northern California, um, north of San Francisco, in Mendocino County. What I usually do is um, leave open the summer. Um, I try to take um, a vacation for a week or so. But then I don't uh, travel during the summer. I try to devote summers to my writing. Uh, but I agree with him. It's really difficult to write while you're also teaching. Well, yeah, I'm sure that uh, there are uh, many other authors uh, that you could have invited. I uh, appreciate the invitation extended uh, to me. Um, and I guess I would say that the um, the writer of the email who considers me a, what did he call me, a hard left hard, radical? Hard of left the, radical, yeah. Of the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, um, well, I like to continue to think of myself as a radical. I, I think that um, is um, an identification that is admirable. And I appreciate the fact that, that uh, there are members of my generation who have continued to uh, um, make efforts to further justice and equality. And I, I would be quite uh, afraid of the moment when it no longer mattered to me. Oh, I don't detest democracy, as a matter of fact. Um, I um, see myself as someone who uh, is very much um, committed to democracy and democracy, a democracy without racism, a democracy uh, without the kind of economic exploitation that is so characteristic uh, of global capitalism, a democracy in which uh, uh, um, Americans don't see themselves as uh, uh, the foremost practitioners of democracy, a democracy that would involve global solidarities, global citizenship. I, yes, I very much see myself as a proponent of uh, democracy, not someone who is attempting to destroy it. I could name some people I think are uh, trying to destroy like democracy. Who? Uh, well, it seems to me that the our um, current government, the Bush administration, has done more to damage democracy over the last uh, several years. Uh, you know, particularly the Patriot Act and the efforts to revise the Patriot Act, which uh, uh, have uh, eroded civil rights, civil liberties, human rights, human... Um, I, I, you know, I think about what happened in Abu Ghraib and um, how it is that uh, the, the Iraqi prisoners could be treated in such an awful way in the process of bringing democracy to Iraq. So it, it's, it, it seems to me that we have to ask the question, is, is this precisely the kind of democracy that dominant uh, uh, forces in the United States represent to the people of the world. You know, I'm not certain, and um, I appreciate your comments, uh, but I should tell you that I've never aspired to be in a textbook, uh, although uh, when I reflect on this sometimes, I think that what might matter uh, is uh, a... Um, a way to retain a sense of the power that was created by the people who um, fought for my freedom, um, that might be helpful. That might help us uh, recognize that it is possible to um, create the kind of um, movement that can bring about change, that can make immediate change. I think that would be helpful to know. Um, but I'm not concerned that people know me or remember me. I'm concerned more about the issues. Uh, and I certainly would like uh, to see 
the issues in textbooks that uh, younger generations are reading. And right now, as you probably know if you've been watching this program, I'm very much involved in efforts to uh, uh, develop a critique of and change the prison system in this country, the prison industrial complex is the term that uh, we use. And so I would like to see that in textbooks. I would like to see students learn different vocabularies. I would like uh, students learn how to talk about democracy uh, in uh, a more critical way. Well, um, sexism, of course, is um, an acknowledged aspect of uh, the um, structures of domination in um, our lives. I don't know whether things would have been entirely different had I been uh, a man. I, do, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it may very well be that precisely because of the uh, ways in which uh, people were encouraged to think about women that uh, more people <laughs> got involved in the struggle for my freedom. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But I do think that it is um, important to uh, point out that in the campaign around prisoners in general against the prison industrial complex that women are s most often left out, that prisons are seen to be a male issue, and that the, the fact that relatively fewer women are in prison often gives people the license to ignore women altogether. And what I would argue is that precisely by looking at uh, uh, women in prison, precisely by looking at that complex of issues around women in prison, we're able to understand more of what this um, system as a whole does uh, within the society. More the impact it has on, on women, of course, but also more the impact it has on men. More the connections between what goes on inside prisons and what happens uh, outside. Um, so I think a feminist um, um, critical approach uh, would benefit all of us, uh, regardless of what our particular gender might be. Well, I'm sorry if you have dif difficulty conceptualizing the possibility of um, democracy and uh, socialism, or democracy and uh, communism. Um, and I'm not necessarily referring to any past experiment. I'm referring to what we might need for the future. Uh, because uh, the socialist community of nations was uh, dismantled and no longer exists, uh, there is no Cold War any longer, although one would not know it uh, from some of the policies that emanate uh, from Washington. Uh, the fact that um, socialism um, or the socialist uh, international structure was dismantled, we still have Cuba, and I'm very much a supporter of uh, the Cuban Revolution, which uh, uh, continues to try to demonstrate that it is possible to serve people's needs, that it is possible to have um, free education uh, from child care all the way up to the postgraduate uh, 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 status. It is possible to have um, housing that costs only a very small fracture of one's income, or it is possible to have free health care. Um, the fact that the socialist community of nations was dismantled does not mean, it seems to me, that capitalism has triumphed. Uh, forever, uh, but rather it means that uh, those of us who are committed to a different uh, kind of uh, social economic world need to be even uh, more uh, anxious about uh, challenging capitalism. Um, and of course if we were able to talk to uh, each other face to face, we might have a very interesting um, 
conversation, but I appreciate your comments, and, uh, and I must say that uh, I, 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 I would have liked the opportunity to persuade you that, uh, that democracy and socialism are not uh, contradictory. As a matter of fact, they're less contradictory than capitalism and democracy. Well, I think that, um, that the civil rights movement uh, during the 1960s created a terrain. It created a terrain that allowed uh, many um, uh, groups and communities to uh, think about uh, a particular um, issues of discrimination and domination. Certainly the women's movement as it developed uh, in the 60s would not have been possible uh, uh, without the backdrop of the civil rights movement. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, the movement of women of color, uh, certainly the gay, lesbian, now bisexual, transgender movement would not have been um, conceptualized in the same way had it not happened against the backdrop of civil rights, uh, the civil rights movement. I think the, the uh, problem is that uh, uh, some people, including some leaders, tend to see the gay movement as supplanting the uh, anti-racist movement, uh, which makes no sense, uh, because in order to have a movement uh, uh, against homophobia, a movement um, that w would strive for justice uh, for uh, gays and lesbians. There would have to be a movement for uh, women's justice there. There would have to be a movement for racial justice there. So it seems to me that we need to see how these movements uh, um, develop and overlap and are mutually constitutive. Uh, but I would like to say, that in light of the current issues, uh, uh, gay marriage, uh, that uh, you know, while this has become the, you know, one of the hottest political topics, uh, uh, we shouldn't forget the the critiques of the institution of marriage uh, that have had an important impact on the way we think about women and the way we think about. Uh, uh, marriage. I uh, don't want to argue that the critique of the nuclear family is something that uh, we should give up, particularly uh, given the, uh, the role of women in that particular uh, configuration. Um, but of course, um, as uh, many people point out there are never any guarantees. Uh, uh, you may feel like you're engaging in the same struggles all over again, but as a matter of fact, each, um, each generation, each uh, historical period, we have to remake the past in order to uh, make the future. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think, uh, I don't, I'm not sure what you would uh, refer to uh, as personal discrimination. Uh, but uh, my sense is that uh, it is important to uh, have, a, have a connection with the um, sort of structural impact of these uh, forms of discrimination. Well, I think you should get involved. It's very difficult for individuals to have an, have, uh, an impact on, um, on the world. So I would suggest you investigate in your community what kinds of organizations there are and get involved in um, an organization or some kind of campaign that best fits your um, interests. And of course this question of violence comes up over and over again. It's, it, I, I'm just amazed that uh, that it, it seems to be the, the first question that people ask of uh, those who consider themselves to be radicals or, or revolutionaries. I don't think anyone wants 
violence. No one welcomes violence. Violence, however it expresses itself, is bad. Uh, uh, at the same time, it's important to recognize that the major purveyors of violence are, uh, the major purveyor of violence is the state. And um, when we consider what the U.S. military has done all over the world and the connection between that kind of violence, the violence that happens uh, uh, in prisons, the violence that happens in, and we were talking about this early on, I think this was one of the first questions, the, the circuits of violence that move from um, the bedroom to the prison. Uh, I, in light of that, um, I don't think we want to further perpetuate any form of violence. But at the same time, I, I, I think as we would all agree that we have the right to self-defense. Well, the legacy of the Black Power Movement um, um, would, I think, um, be that if we are to achieve justice and equality and um, liberation, we have to examine uh, the systemic uh, 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 role of discrimination and oppression. We can't simply focus on the laws although changing laws are extremely important. And that, when, don't get me wrong, that was a very important moment. Uh, the fact that the laws governing segregation were indeed abolished. But that is not going to do it uh, uh, in its entirety. Uh, we can't simply change attitudes. Uh, but we also have to look at institutions and structures. and. Um, it seems to me that at this moment, one of the most important legacies of that movement uh, would be the, the global solidarities uh, that were generated, the internationalism of the black power movement. I think we need more of that uh, internationalism and those global solidarities today. Well, you seem to have done a lot of research uh, in that area. And I, I don't know whether I can give you um, um, an answer to your question. It may very well be that all uh, three of those um, uh, points that you made are valid. Um, we do know that uh, uh, there was some involvement with drugs and that uh, uh, that uh, as I said earlier, when someone asked a question about Huey Newton, that um, said to many people that uh, the problems uh, in communities of color, problems in you know black communities with drugs and so forth, uh, uh, did not discriminate, uh, and that Huey Newton fell prey to those problems as well. Well, okay, I'm, I'm very glad um, the name Mumia Abu-Jamal came up during this program. Uh, he is, of course, uh, one of the now longest held political prisoners uh, who um, was, I believe, falsely charged with killing a policeman. He is in prison in Pennsylvania now, facing the death penalty. What is most important about uh, Mumia, I think, is the fact that he um, is a, um, he's one of the foremost uh, uh, proponents of the abolition of the death penalty. And when he speaks, he speaks not primarily for himself. He speaks for people all over the country, all over the world, who find themselves in this uh, predicament. Um, I'll tell you one thing I've done. I can't, if, if we wanted to take another three hours, then we could talk about the way in which the campaign to free Mumia Abu Jamal has unfolded over the, the last uh, decade. But I can tell you that um, one year ago, approximately one year ago, I was asked to travel to Paris to um, participate in a ceremony in the Hotel de Ville, 
uh, where the mayor of Paris uh, designated, formally designated uh, Mumia a citizen of Paris. And this is the first time uh, this title of honorary citizen of Paris was bestowed on anyone due to the political uh, um, circumstances since Pablo Picasso. Uh, and as a matter of fact, what's interesting is that in France, um, everyone knows his name. Uh, he's become honorary citizen, an honorary citizen in many cities, towns, and villages, and school children know his name. They know about this uh, uh, black man who became a grandfather sitting on death row in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, no, yeah, but it's a totally different situation. Mm. Uh, uh, and that, that, that was a, a personal emotional uh, response. I didn't really expect there to be as much coverage as, uh, I think, as the assassination of the president. But it happened uh, around uh, the same time. And I was describing my emotional response, that I couldn't, I couldn't find any um, community there at that time. Yes, I knew the girls. I knew th uh, had connections with three out of the, the four girls there. But when I was in jail, there was a huge movement in France. As a matter of fact, um, uh, some of the major writers uh, participated in uh, what became a campaign that swept the entire um, country. So I'm indebted to the French uh, uh, for their work on my behalf. Well, I would suggest um, uh, Eric Williams' book. Eric Williams, of course, was the prime minister of uh, Trinidad, but his book, Capitalism and Slavery, is uh, a really important uh, contribution. Well, it's a collection of writings that I've done on the issue of um, prison, the prison industrial complex, prison abolition, historical examinations of uh, the relationship between slavery and the emergent punishment uh, system. <laughs> okay. Okay, two very different questions, and I'm trying to imagine where you found that, uh, that quote, but I assume it must must have been in connection with my discussion of, uh, of emancipation, the end of slavery. And, uh, and I must have been referring to the extent to which sexuality under slavery was subordinated to the task of reproducing the slave population. So that in many cases, uh, uh, neither women nor men had the agency to decide with whom they would enter into sexual relations. Uh, um, and so I argue that uh, in the aftermath of slavery, sexuality then began to carry um, some of these aspirations for freedom. And thus, we have to look at the, the role that um, sexuality plays in the blues. Uh, somewhat differently. We have to think about it not as giving expression only to sexual desire, but also to desire for um, liberation. And I try to do uh, readings of various texts of, of blue songs, uh, uh, in this book particularly by Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith, that give us a sense of the way in which um, sex carries um, connotations uh, of uh, liberation and freedom, that, that it's, uh, it's, it, it's about sexual desire, but it's also about the desire for freedom. Well, but there are so many definitions of Pan-Africanism, I uh, uh, would, would hesitate to answer a general question like that. but. Um, I, I would say that my um, link to Pan-Africanism has always been shaped by W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, notion of uh, a coming together of people of African descent uh, in order to challenge imperialism. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I don't believe that uh, uh, people of African descent 
regardless of where they may be, have some essential bond with one another, those bonds have to be created. Uh, they have to be created uh, by building communities of struggle. Well, I'm not sure I understood the, the entire thrust of the question. Um, but I will say that I appreciate the fact that the caller works for the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. That organization has, do has done extremely important work, particularly in challenging hate violence and uh, the, the Ku Klux Klan. Um, um, so, yeah, more power to you. I would have to say, unfortunately, we do not have nearly as many students of color uh, as we ought to have. Uh, this has something to do with the um, disestablishment of affirmative action in California. Uh, but no, I have, my, my classes are almost always predominantly white. Well, you know, you, you're constantly asking me um, questions about my um, sort of, you know, personal uh, position, mm -hmm. and I kind of deflect them because I don't see myself uh, as having accomplished this uh, as, a, as an individual. Um, yes, people tell me this all the time. They, 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 they talk about what an inspiration I've been. And I, I'm happy to accept that, but I know that I'm not the one who's been the inspiration to them. I know that it's a, it has been a um, um, communities of people, and uh, you know, first of all, no one would ever know my name had not it been for the emergence of that movement we talked about earlier uh, when I went to jail. Uh, second of all, in all of the things that I've done uh, that have had some impact, including the books that I've written, uh, I've, 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 I've always uh, felt myself a part of a larger community. I've never felt myself uh, to be alone. So I can't take uh, the credit for all of this as a single individual. <laughs> Well, I was about to say, if you hadn't asked me that <laughs> on the air, <laughs> you know, I might have told you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, first of all, I, I think that it's really important that you're doing that work. Uh, uh, yeah, sometimes I do um, I do interviews, but uh, I should tell you that um, it's impossible to keep up with all of the requests. I, I, can't keep up with my email, uh, and I, I'm, I'm so frustrated. I don't know what to do. I would love to do it, but at the same time, I can't. Um, there are only 24 hours in the day, and I have a you know hard time uh, doing all of the things that are expected of me. Uh, but you might um, look at. There probably are quite a few interviews online already, and, and you might look at that and. You know, there are a couple of books, so you can read my autobiography that goes up to um, 1973, um, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was reluctant to write uh, this autobiography. I uh, did not feel that I was uh, old enough to write an autobiography at that time. and. Uh, you know, Toni Morrison is one of the people who persuaded me that it could be done. Um, I was reluctant because I didn't want to focus on myself as an individual. Um, but I must say that today I'm glad that I wrote my autobiography at that time because I don't know whether I will write another one. Uh, uh, I'm glad I wrote it at that time because um, I was able to sort out uh, my life um, in very different terms uh, from the way I would uh, organize it and think about it today. Of course, uh, things have gotten far more complicated, and uh, you know I'm not sure whether whether I'll do that. But um, possibly, if I have time, I'll consider writing some memoirs. Uh. Okay. The the question regarding uh, drugs. Um, 
I think you raise an important question. It, um, it has to do with the racialization of our ideas about uh, drugs, uh, but it also has to do with the particular division of labor that has been established. We have um, a huge pharmaceutical industry, and I always like to talk about drugs in this broader context, not only about um, uh, illegal drugs, uh, illicit drugs, but also the fact that we live in a drug culture that we are um, persuaded that, uh, that by the pharmaceutical companies that drugs are a panacea. Uh, and of course, many people take drugs, uh, prescription drugs, and you know, prescription drugs that are psychotropic drugs. Uh, we've had a proliferation of, a whole, of whole generations of psychotropic drugs uh, recently. Um, but if people use drugs that are uh, mind-altering, that are not uh, considered legal, they're considered criminals. Uh, and I think this, that we have to think about uh, the uh, way in which these uh, discourses uh, uh, intersect with each other and uh, reinforce each other. Yeah, the upcoming election, the election in November 2004, uh, is going to be a very difficult election. Um, and we cannot forget, as uh, the emailer uh, indicated, that the election four years ago was uh, marred by the uh, fact that people were not allowed, particularly black people, were not allowed to exercise their voting rights um, in at least one state, many more. But uh, we know in the state of Florida uh, what happened. Uh, we also know about d the, disenfranchi the disenfranchisement processes that happen in connection with uh, imprisonment uh, so that people who um, have been out of prison for many, many years and may have completely refashioned their lives uh, and may never have done anything really that serious to begin with, but it's 25 years later and um, they, they contribute to their communities, but they're not allowed to vote in places like Florida and Alabama. Uh, because uh, uh, there is what is called felony disenfranchisement. Now, um, the upcoming elections, uh, yeah, I'm rather disturbed about the particular choices we have in the election, but I can say that, um, that I go along with uh, the slogan that I've seen in various uh, sites, uh, which uh, uh, says, re-defeat Bush. Uh, because Bush was not really elected in the first place. He was, uh, of course, selected by the Supreme Court. But that is my inclination. Yeah, um, I think what you're saying is that uh, we also need to have alternatives. We also uh, need to um, create conditions. In, and it's not only black communities, it's in Latino communities, it's uh, in poor white communities, it's in many Asian American communities. And it's especially in uh, Native American communities. Um, uh, and I, I think you're right about the ease with which uh, uh, drugs travel across uh, borders. We also have to think about the ease with which corporations uh, um, travel across all kinds of borders in order to find cheap labor, you know, global capitalism. Um, but it uh, is uh, important, it seems to me, for us to think about how to create the the kinds of conditions that will uh, lure young people away from the seduction of drugs. Uh, you know, what, what is there that might uh, uh, persuade young people that, that the future has some meaning? Uh, 
And this is why I always come back to the question of revamping our educational system. It's not just about more money. It's about new ideas. It's about uh, creating classroom spaces that are exciting for young people, uh, that can encourage them to use their brains and to be creative. But that's where I think we have to go. Well, of course, I'm talking about, I'm talking about early on. Right. Uh, uh, because you can't expect someone who in first grade is treated as if uh, 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 being quiet is more important than learning how to read uh, or uh, learning how to walk through a metal detector and revealing that one has no guns is more important than uh, you know, learning um, how to acquire the discipline of knowledge. Uh, but in my classrooms, uh, which are some undergraduate and mostly graduate, I, I try to uh, formulate questions. I, I don't like inflicting knowledge on students. And I think this is one of the major problems with the education system. We inflict too much information. There is so much information out there. Uh, so much so that people feel overwhelmed now, but we inflict too many facts. The question is, to me, is how to um, theorize. Uh, and when I say theorize, I'm not talking about making theory. I'm talking about developing understanding. So how to be critical in one's examination of these, uh, this multiplicity of facts. So I try to raise the kinds of questions that will encourage students to raise questions themselves. Okay, I don't think I said history is important, but I think I may, but I do uh, um, think I know uh, what was meant there. And um, I think I was, because I've said this on um, many occasions, I refer to the tendency on the part of young people to want direction and guidance and role models uh, from older generations and the tendency to um, kind of bow down before the older generation. And so what I was saying was that uh, uh, younger people also have to um, be willing to break with some of the ideas of their um, um, their elders, uh, their elders, their ancestors, their grandmothers, grandfathers, mothers, fathers. Uh, they have to learn how to uh, challenge those, and including my own ideas. Uh, and I think I was probably referring precisely, I was probably answering a question uh, from someone who asked me, uh, what can be done? What can you do? What can we do as young people? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I, said, I often say I feel really unequipped to answer that question because I can remember that as a young person myself, uh, we challenged the, the older uh, generations, and, you know, including um, people who were only a few years older than we were, say people in their 30s. Uh, um, so I, th I, I think it is important to uh, be experimental, uh, to be creative. Uh, uh, we were referring to, we were talking about Huey Newton and Bobby Seale earlier on, but when they decided that they would um, take, uh, take law books and, a, and guns, at that time it was legal to carry unconcealed weapons in California. So they, they both had a gun and a law book, uh, symbols of... Uh, of uh, self-defense and justice and began to patrol the community in Oakland uh, to see which, who was being stopped by the cops and they would approach the police uh, making an arrest and ask the person being arrested whether they were aware of their, their rights. Uh, in any event, uh, I mean, we could go on talking about the Black Panther Party, but this was, this was a moment, this was an idea, this was an idea that probably sounded absolutely insane uh, to many people, yet it sparked 
uh, this uh, movement. It's, it, it, it laid the basis for an organization that attracted thousands and thousands of people you know, all over. Well, it sounds like you've been thinking about uh, what you might do to change that. Um, you can't um, uh, instantaneously uh, politicize a generation in directions you would like to see them go. It's a long process. Uh, uh, and it seems to me that, that people are active and political in other ways, that we, ways in which we don't necessarily um, acknowledge now. So I don't, I really don't like to uh, express this kind of uh, wholesale criticism of uh, the younger generations because I've seen young people doing amazing work as artists, for example, amazing work as organizers, uh, uh, as um, union activists uh, in the anti-globalization movement, for example, uh, in the movement to free Mumia Abu Jamal, for example. So I, my suggestion to you uh, would be to take on the challenge you have articulated uh, yourself that you've formulated in the form of a question to me and ask yourself uh, what you can do uh, among the young people in your communities. Well, thank you. Thank you for your comments. And of course, I live in Oakland, uh, so I appreciate, I especially appreciate your comments. Um, as Older people, we always express frustration at uh, what the younger generation uh, doesn't know because we assume that they should know all that we know. But they can never know all that we know. Uh, what they can do is take some of what we know and transform it so that it becomes even more productive. Uh, and that, that is the hope that, that I have. I have given up the um, frustrations at, at uh, young people for not doing what I think they should do, uh, for not knowing what I think they should know. Um, but um, but I, I still retain the hope that they uh, can take something of what us, the, the others uh, know, the older people know, and and take that and transform it into something that will help to change the world. Oh, um, well, I would say maybe the, the last uh, book, which is, a, which is a small popular book called Are Prisons Obsolete? I think that would be um, a good introduction. Um, some of the issues I've touched on today are examined in greater detail in, in this book. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably what I would suggest. No, I do not uh, know the book, so thank you for your call. Well, I'll have to say that I'm both pleased and disappointed. Uh, yes, uh, Birmingham has changed a great deal uh, since then. When I grew up, when I was growing up in Birmingham, uh, I only got to know a very small portion of what is considered Birmingham because black people um, just were not allowed in those neighborhoods. Uh, and now when I go back, I find myself exploring new parts of Birmingham each time. I mean, this is like uh, decades later, and I, I realize how uh, little I was uh, uh, allowed to uh, familiarize myself with the city where I grew up. Uh, Okay, it's better in the sense that there more, there's more accessibility. Um, but it's worse in the sense that uh, the economic conditions in Birmingham reflect uh, deindustrialization, globalization. The major industry in Birmingham used to be the steel industry. Birmingham was called the Pittsburgh of the South. And, you know, one of the things I remember is that uh, so many of my friends' um, fathers uh, 
worked either in the mines or in the steel mills uh, where uh, there was still segregation but people could earn a decent living. Now um, there's one mill left in Birmingham and it is a museum, Sloss Furnaces, uh, that uh, uh, hopes to uh, uh, preserve at least uh, something of the history of Birmingham. And so the poverty in Birmingham is even g greater than it was when I was uh, growing up. Uh, uh, one of the last times I went to Birmingham, I visited a, a prison uh, in Elmore, Alabama, outside of uh, Birmingham. And I was just amazed at, uh, I shouldn't have been, because I knew this already, but to walk into this prison and to see um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, this was a male prison, so we're talking about black men. Uh, it kind of um, took me back to the days of slavery in my, in my imagination. So, yeah, I think things have gotten better in Birmingham, but they've also gotten a lot worse. Okay, see, this would be a very complicated conversation that I would have to have uh, with you. And, um, it would be a conversation about black capitalism, it would be a conversation about black English, it would be a conversation about the world today. But let me just say very briefly, I think that, um, that um, there is, um, uh, let me put it this way, um, the way in which black people historically learn to speak English needs to be preserved. Uh, there, there, there are uh, uh, ways of speaking English that are very popular in black communities that, that, that cannot be uh, simply dismissed. Uh, um, however, I do think it's important to also learn standard English and to be able to distinguish between uh, black English and standard English. And I think this is the problem we are confronting now. I don't uh, think that we should uh, uh, try to bury uh, black English, which is very creative. And as a matter of fact, if one looks at the way in which um, black English has penetrated uh, the um, standard English and the kinds of things that um, people who uh, 30 years ago would never be caught saying, you know, something like right on, which came out of the Black Panther Party. Now everyone says this, so I, I don't want to dismiss the, the creative and important contributions that uh, black people have made to um, speaking English, but I do think it is also important to learn um, uh, what we call standard uh, uh, grammar and to be able to uh, tell the difference. And not primarily because it is going to uh, bring more money. Uh, is I, this, this tendency to commodi commodify everything, that one has to get a good education, because if we get a good education, this means we can earn more money. This tendency to subordinate everything to money is what I think is a major problem uh, today. So we have to uh, unhook that or disconnect that and and be able to talk about the value of uh, of language, the value of knowledge, not uh, uh, not the um, commercial value or the com commodified value or the exchange value well. No, I wouldn't answer the question in that way. Uh, I would um, talk about the impact of um, capitalism on the Chinese economy and uh, the, the globalization of uh, capital. I would talk about the um, global assembly line. I don't uh, know whether Mao would have been in agreement with the uh, the way things uh, turned in China, although I don't even know whether that's a legitimate question. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily 
um, ask ask that question. But I do think it is important for all of us to be aware of the extent to which uh, economies are connected, you know, all over the world, and that this hurts. Uh, uh, people and communities in the global south, that, that we are often not aware of the fact that uh, the clothes we wear bear the, the imprint of the work that is done by young girls in um, Asia and, 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 and Africa. We, th we think of these things as if they just uh, were, th as if they just appeared out of nowhere. But of course, they uh, mark the increased exploitation, particularly, I should say, particularly of girls uh, in places uh, of the globe like Asia and Africa, Latin America. Yeah, I, I agree, I think. Uh, um, I mean, it's interesting, of course, uh, that there's been so much a focus on the Black Panther Party and Huey Newton during this conversation. It, uh, you know, tells me that there are still a whole number of resolved issues, unresolved issues. Um, the, the question of um, people taking care of themselves, um, leaders taking care of themselves, but I think we would extend this to uh, anyone. Yes, uh, uh, we, we have to learn how to uh, take care of ourselves, particularly at a time when um, we uh, are receiving messages uh, that you know drugs are the answer, as as I was saying before. Uh, but I would like to append to your comment the fact that uh, people who get out of prison uh, do not find the kinds of conditions that will allow them to get a job, to get an education, to uh, rent an apartment. Uh, I find it amazing that with, uh, with uh, over two million people in prison in general, what happens is someone gets out, they're given maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars, and they're expected to, uh, sometimes after having been in prison for 20, 30 years, they're expected to make it on their own. This, this is absurd. Uh, so I think we also have to learn how to take care of those who have been under the uh, 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 who have lived under the auspices of the state for so many years of their lives. Well, I think um, you have to express yourself. Uh, you have to say what's in your heart. Uh, and uh, what I think would be most important for you would be to find a community. Uh, because as I've been trying to say um, throughout these hours. Uh, my experience is that as individuals, uh, uh, we're, we're capable of very little, even though we tend to um, uh, represent individuals as heroes and we ascribe to individuals work that really has been done by um, large communities of people. So my first advice to you would be to find a community uh, uh, and which you feel comfortable, and a community which will support you uh, as you uh, uh, speak out uh, against homophobia, against racism, uh, for justice, for equality. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, am, uh, as I th think I may have said, I, I'm sometimes uh, disturbed, I'm taken aback, First of all, it always shocks me, it surprises me when, when I see these uh, new uh, t-shirts and, and posters or some music group takes my image. What, what I have recognized is that it's really not about me. It's about a particular um, image that was created again by people in struggle. So it's okay, uh, I guess, uh, if you understand it in that way. I uh, do not like to be considered someone who uh, is uh, uh, the sort of penultimate uh, revolutionary, uh, the sort of you know symbol of uh, radicalism, because I al always felt myself a part of uh, 
as I said before, a community. So where are all of those other people in the images? Uh, you know, uh, there were uh, probably at least uh, several million Afros during that period. What happened to them? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, right after uh, my trial was over, I uh, remember someone contacted me about an article that was in a newspaper in the Midwest. And the article indicated that I had killed three judges. Uh, and, and it really, it upset me uh, because, uh, you know, not only had I not uh, uh, killed anyone, uh, uh, I had just finished a trial in which I had been found not guilty, right? So I, um, I wanted to sue this person, and you know, I talked to my attorneys, and then you know, finally I let it go, and I realized that there's going to be a lot of that, and that I'm not really the person about whom all of these allegations are being made. It is about uh, these um, images that circulate. It is about constructions that come out of uh, conservative communities, constructions that come out of communities that have uh, aspirations toward um, radicalism and bringing about change. And that, to me, is what matters in the final analysis. Thank you for inviting me. And